We're only seven minutes late, so uh, I apologize. Um, but uh, it is um, January 8th, and we're going to call this uh, meeting to order. Um, and uh, uh, I will say, uh, though this is my first council meeting, uh, I expect uh, you all are seasoned council members, so it's a great honor to be with you. And when you see me being out of line as a chair, uh, you can wink to Liz and she'll kick me, so uh, <laughs> many ways we can communicate. Um, but I think we'll have an interesting meeting ahead. We have some uh, good reports, fairly short agenda, uh, but it'll be an opportunity for uh, a conversation. So uh, first, the approval of uh, the agenda. Is there a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Second. Second, thank you, uh, Mr. Turner. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, thank you. And also the minutes uh, from the last meeting, December 11th, which you reviewed ahead of time. Is there a motion for approval or discussion? Corrections, additions? Additions. So moved. Thank you. Second. Councilmember Johnson, thank you for a second. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> Thank you. Both those motions have been approved. So the next order of business is an opportunity for public comment. Uh, I was very curious. The public comment is in the beginning, not the end, which I think is very wise. So that's part of our natural protocol. There's an opportunity first for public comment uh, on the specific issue of, uh, of our draft body camera policy for the um, uh, Metro Transit uh, Police Department, um, and if there is public uh, comment, there's an opportunity for that now. If um, there's uh, uh, opportunities for additional public comment or written comments, uh, I believe for the next uh, couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is the only opportunity. No so if there's no sign up, is there any other public comment on any other issue that's not on the agenda? I thought everybody was here to make comments, but uh, I'm, I'm disappointed. <laughs> All right, well, then we'll move forward with the consent agenda. Uh, everybody has seen uh, the consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda, or is there any discussion, questions? Move to approve. Thank you. Second. Uh, thank you for a second. All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, the motion passes. So now, racing along, we're with the reports from the standing committees, and I believe we have a report from Council Member Linegren. Um, Thank you, Chair Zelli, and congratulations. Yeah, the Community Development Committee brings uh, one item forward for consideration today, and it's from this week's uh, Community Development Committee. There are timing guidelines we are trying to make with this item. Uh, it's 2020-16 to approve the resolution 2020-1, our first of the new decade, adopting an affordable and life cycle housing goals for the decade of 2011 to 2020 for the city of Little Canada. Uh, as most council members know, know, as most council members know, the, according to the Livable Communities Act, a city must participate in the local housing incentives account program to be eligible to receive grants <coughs> or loans under the Metropolitan Council Livable Communities Fund, and receive funding for certain polluted sites cleanup from the Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development. To participate in the local housing incentives account program, a city must establish affordable and life cycle housing goals that are consistent with and promote the policies of the Metropolitan Council. The City of Little Canada has passed a resolution electing to participate in the Local Housing Initiatives Account Program and establish affordable and life cycle housing unit goals. These goals are consistent with the Metropolitan Council policies and are detailed in the attached resolution. The Metropolitan Council's Community Development Committee held the required public hearing at their December 16th, 2019 meeting and held the public record open for 10 days. No comments were received. Mr. Chair, I move that the Metropolitan Council approve the attached resolution 2020-1, adopting the Livable Communities Act local housing incentives account, affordable and life cycle housing goals adopted by the City of Little Canada uh, and to participate in the Livable Communities Act beginning calendar year 2020. Thank you, Member Lenegren. Is there a second to his motion? 
Mr. Chair, um, I'd like to second that uh, motion, and I'd like to speak to it when there's an opportunity. There's a perfect opportunity right now. Great. I represent um, the city of Little Canada. I've had a couple of conversations with their city administrator, and they are very excited about the opportunity to be a part of the, a part of the livable communities. Spoke with them yesterday and um, let them know that I didn't think there were going to be any problems tonight. So I just want you to know how excited the city is and how grateful they are for our speedy action. Thank you. Thank you, Member Vento, and we'll make sure that's reflected <laughs> in the minutes. Any other discussion, comments? Hearing none, uh, uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, that report uh, uh, is carried. Uh, and also, we have another uh, 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 report uh, from, uh, uh, from a joint report from the Environment and Community Development uh, Committees. And I understand, uh, Member Linegren, you have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the Community Development Committee and Environment Committee uh, bring two business items. They're comprehensive plans for communities connected to the regional wastewater system. They were all heard in community development and the environment committee, committees. For both communities, council staff found that the 2040 plans conform to regional systems plans, are consistent with council policies, and are compatible with the plans of adjacent and affected jurisdictions. The first of these is business item 2019-310. It's the, uh, to authorize the 2040 Comprehensive Plan for the City of Rosemont. Um, Mr. Chair, I move that the Metropolitan Council adopt the attached advisory comments and review record and take the following actions. Uh, from the Community Development Committee, authorize the City of Rosemont to place its 2040 Comprehensive Plan into effect. And also within 60 days after receiving final DNR approval, the city must adopt the Mississippi River Corridor Critical Area Plan and submit a copy of the final adopted plan and evidence of adoption to the DNR, to the council, and to the National Park Service within 10 days after adoption. The recommendation from the Environment Committee is to approve the city of Ro Rosemont's comprehensive sewer plan. Thank you very much. Uh... Uh, Member Lundgren, is there a second to the motion? Second, second there, Chair. Thank you. Uh, any discussion, question on that report? No? Then all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> Thank you very much. That is carried. So now we're going to uh, hear a number of, a couple of information items. Mr. Chair, there's another uh, joint committee item. To oh, I'm so sorry. So the next joint committee item is 2019-352. Oh, member, whenever. Thank you, I, sir. Thank I, you, Mr. I, Chair. Forgive me. Yes. Proceed. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, it's 2019-352 to authorize the 2040 Comprehensive Plan for the City of St. Francis. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move that the Metropolitan Council adopt the attached advisory comments and review record and take the following actions. The recommendations from the Community Development Committee to authorize the City of St. Francis to place its 2040 Comprehensive Plan into effect. Also to revise the City's sewer serviced forecasts upward as shown in Table 2 of the attached review record. Also revise the affordable housing need allocation to 213 units. And finally, advise the city to implement the advisory comments and the review record for wastewater, surface water management, forecasts, land use, and water supply. And the recommendation from the Environment Committee to approve the City of St. Francis Comprehensive Sewer Plan. Second. Second, thank you. Any discussion, question? Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, that report. Uh, has passed, and for the record, I am wearing glasses, so there are two items there. <laughs> um, uh, now we are ready for uh, other business, and uh, we're going to hear two items. The first, uh, uh, a uh, information about engaging with people experiencing homelessness, and uh, we're going to hear from Terry Smith and staff who are now assembling. So welcome, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Squish three of us up here, then you don't have to keep looking both ways. Um, Mr. Chair, thanks for having us, and welcome to your first Metropolitan Council meeting. Uh, my name is Terry Smith. 
good afternoon um, to the rest of the council members. My name is Terry Smith. I'm the director of the Council's Housing and Redevelopment Authority. Happy to be with you here today, and I'm here with my colleagues, uh, Brooke Blakey, the sergeant with the uh, Metro Transit Police Homeless Action Team, and then senior outreach coordinator, uh, Ryan Oppen Oppenheim Leapite. Yes, thank you. Sorry, it's a tangle. Um, we're here to hear, tell you about the work that the council is doing, engaging with people experiencing homelessness, um, trying to uh, want to share with you some of the recent actions that we've completed, um, talk about where we were in 2019, where we're going in 2020, and share some of the exciting work with you. I'm going to start with a few background slides, and then Ryan and Brooke will share the real work that's going on, and then we'll wrap it up with a um, summary slide. So just as a review, um, the Metro HRA is a housing authority here at the council. Um, we are, were created as part of the council in 1974 through the Minnesota legislature really to administer rent assistance programs for low-income families. The mission of the housing authority is to provide decent, safe, and affordable housing opportunities to encourage housing choice throughout the region, including areas of high opportunity, to foster family stability and provide self-sufficiency for people with low wealth. It's through this mission that we administer rent assistance for 7,200 families in the region, providing rent assistance benefits through 10 different programs. And these include programs that specifically provide rent assistance for people experiencing homelessness. And we're gonna highlight one of those programs for you here today. The Metro HRA distributes about $60 million each year in rent payments to private landlords throughout the region. This slide here is meant to be um, a background. I work for the Housing Authority. I don't work for the transit organization, but through our <coughs> partnership, um, I've learned um, of all these statistics and have been working in close partnership with the Homeless Action Team for the last year. Uh, the 2019 point in time count was held the night of January 23rd, 2019. This is Minnesota's count of all people experiencing homelessness, and it includes people and individuals that are living in, um, staying in shelters, that are part of a transitional housing program, and populations and people that are unsheltered, meaning people that are sleeping outside, sleeping in places not meant for human habitation, and that includes the transit system. According to the 2019 count, there were 7,977 people experiencing homelessness on one night in January. That's a lot of people. Um, 1,600 or 21 percent of those are experiencing unsheltered homelessness so are sleeping outside on the trains, other places not meant for human habitation. People of color are disproportionately represented among the people experiencing homelessness. Um, in fact, um, although that the people of color represent only 16 percent of the population in Minnesota, they represent 65% of people experiencing homelessness. We learned in the 2019 count that indigenous people represent um, are 27 times more likely to experience homelessness, and these are staggering facts. On average, 199 people are using the transit system as shelter on a nightly basis. Um, at times, that reaches 350 people. This means that the transit system has become one of the largest homeless shelters in the state of Minnesota. At its peak in the winter of 2018-2019, that number reached 392, which is a staggering um, amount of people. And as the number of people using the transit system as shelter grew, calls to the Metro Transit Police Department also grew. Um, in 2015, the calls for service were 1,279, and in 2019, that grew to 2,579 calls for service. I want to make clear that the calls for service <coughs> are for many reasons and not necessarily um, people experiencing homelessness creating problems on the trains, but in many cases are the victims of crime as they're um, um, sheltering on the train system. A little bit of history lesson, and this is my last slide before I pass it on for the cool information that they will share, but. Um, the Metro Transit Police in 2019 and even prior to that knew that arresting their way out of this problem was not going to work and that we needed to learn how to engage with people experiencing homelessness in a different way. So er, during the first half of 2018, the Metro Transit Department and the Metro Transit Police 
um, engaged with transit and police agencies all over the country to learn about best practices and um, how other transit agencies are dealing with um, people sheltering on the transit system. Practices including training transit police as outreach workers, um, which was a new way of doing business for the criminal justice system. Um, not criminalizing people experiencing homelessness and we'll talk about what that means. Um, but really with the goal of prevent, preventing homelessness, but then connecting people to the services that they need for housing stability. Um, so in 2019 or in 2018, the fall of 2018, Metro Transit Police created the Homeless Action Team is made up of um, two police sergeants and four officers, and that may have expanded, Brooke can confirm. Yes, I think it's expanded. Um, but that are trained, formally trained in street outreach to engage with homeless people um, in a different way. And as we got into this work, um, the Metro Transit police officers, their new um, uh, ways were effective, but there was a gap and a missing piece, and that piece is housing. They didn't have a connection to housing for people experiencing homelessness. So in the fall again of 2018, the Metro Transit Police Homeless Action Team and Metro Transit and the Metro HRA developed a partnership. And together we applied for some federal housing vouchers to provide rent assistance to get families and individuals connected to housing stability. In the fall again in November of 2018, the Housing Authority Metro HRA was awarded 89 federal housing vouchers for this purpose. Um, and I think at that time, I can say, Brooke can say, I think Ryan too, that we knew this was not gonna solve the problem, but it was just a piece that was gonna help bring us towards solutions. And so we were happy to accept the 89 vouchers and um, Ryan will tell you about the success of those, um, <clears throat> but it was just a beginning of this partnership and this new creative way of doing business to get people linked um, to housing stability. I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Brooke and Ryan next, who are gonna kind of share with you some of the real work that's going on uh, on this front. Good afternoon, I love talking about the Homeless Action Team. It's one of uh, my passions as we develop um, law enforcement being at the table for the first time in a social service capacity and not being the hammer to arrest, arrest our way out of the situation. So I love discussing how we are new and innovative and that's one of the transit ways is taking something that's a unique problem and figuring out how to um, manifest a wonderful product. And with that, I was blessed to work with the women from HRA because I came in and I was like, they told us we couldn't do it and we're gonna do it and we're gonna do it a little differently. And oh, by the way, do you wanna come out at 1 a.m.? Cause that's when all the people are out. And so that's the best way to um, come out. And Ryan said, sure. So the first thing we did was we trained um, all of our officers. We have four officers, now a total of six again in how to be outreach workers. We know how to be police officers, we know what that means, <laughs> um, but learning to talk to people in a different manner, engaging at them, meeting them where they are, and trying to figure out what need do they need to have met at that time. We also learned about crisis intervention because the majority of the individuals that um, we are engaging with are experiencing uh, mental health or chemical dependency, substance abuse, um, addiction, all of those different things. And so how do we meet them where they at, treat them with the dignity and respect that they deserve, as well as protect our asset, which is our trains and transit systems to make sure that we're providing for both um, our customers as well as our non-destination customers, the people who are sleeping and using our transit system for unintended purposes. So all of my officers who were not very happy <clears throat> all became outreach workers. I took their guns from them and I said, go out and learn how to talk to people. And there was a little resistance, but they met it head on and they were all um, graduated. We all got certifications and myself, I went along as well because I never asked them to do anything that I wouldn't do myself. Um, we went out and we were also trained as homeless um, um, system accessors. I'm still working. The last thing that I do before um, I leave this as uh, we will have access as law enforcement officers to HMIS, which is the Homeless Management Information System, and that's how people get into housing. And we are on the front lines, no matter what it is, people call police first. Happy, good, and different. And so if there's somebody who has a housing opportunity, why would they not call us? We see them every day, right? So if you give us access, then we can help facilitate and break down that existing barrier that happens there. Um, we also talked about trauma-informed interviewing. Again, meeting people where they are, <clears throat> their issues and making sure that we're respecting and meeting them and doing the things that they need and not inflicting more trauma. Because people came and said, the police can't do this. And I'm like, we're gonna use that power source that we have because at the end of the day, 
no matter if you've had a bad experience with the police or not, you're still gonna call them. So with that being said, how do we recognize that trauma that they have and turn that into a better experience as well and move forward? Um, building community trust, again, um, you guys can turn on the news on any channel and find that there's not that much trust with the police department. And our goal also was to change that image. We are Metro Transit Police Department. We are representing this wonderful, illustrious corporation. And it makes sense to make sure that when they have those interactions, that it's a positive interaction that they're having. So we are really engaging in the 21st century model of community-oriented policing. We are getting out there and decriminalizing the homeless um, for some of those things. So loitering, public urination, things like that. We've asked for very simple things like porta potties. I know that seems very strange, but um, if I'm living on a place in a train or things like that, I'm going to treat it like my home. So whatever I do in my home, I'm going to do on the train. And I know everyone around this table has gotten a call from a constituent who has said, you know, what's going on, what are you doing? And so our job was to come out, talk about uh, community-oriented policing, but also look at that public will and discuss about the individuals that have nowhere else to go, but how it is our problem, how we're going to share this. And it's not transit bringing the problem. We're just generally the receptacle. We're not displacing individuals. We're actually accepting them. And how do we do that with dignity and provide services with, for them moving forward? Um, one of the things we also did is we decided to work overnight. Most uh, social service agencies that work with the homeless work from nine to five. Well, as many people may or may not know, we meld into the everyday thing from nine to five. No one's paying attention because everybody's going about their daily work. It's not till at night when it becomes a crisis when where am I gonna sleep for the night? Or what am I gonna do for the next day? So it made sense for us to operate during the overnight hours to make sure that we are um, meeting the people where they're at during that time. And the point in time count pointed that out. What we did this year is we added now two more officers during the morning to basically have that warm handoff for those individuals that we've been able to shelter overnight, but those that we haven't to make sure that they're not returning to the train because then we have the folks in the morning rush that are like, why are they still here? We've given you money, you were supposed to move them, why are they still here? And what we're finding is that most um, homeless shelters they open up and have people leave at six o'clock, which is when our morning rush comes and where are they gonna go back to, but to the warm train where um, they're not receiving any services until services start at eight. So it made very much sense for us to um, have officers that work um, in the morning to kind of keep that warm service going forward, as well as working with our other partners, such as St. Paul's Coast Team, which is their community outreach and stabilization team, which really focuses on the mental health component, and then the Minneapolis Police Department's homeless team as well. They're, they're a, a team of two, and they have a large area. We're a team of four, and we have quadrupled that amount, but we're working together, and it made sense to have a collaborative partnership as well as their community navigators. Because in the real time, we need some, some community individuals that are civilians that can go in other places that necessarily the police are not always welcome. All right, thank you. I'm going to tell you a little bit about how the partnership continued to develop between Metro HRA and the Metro Transit Police Department. As Terry told you, this really accelerated in November of 2018 when Metro HRA was awarded 89 mainstream housing vouchers dedicated to serve persons experiencing homelessness with disabilities riding our transit system. The Metro HRA outreach team committed to serving this population with pre-move counseling, housing search, and post-move housing supports. Two senior outreach coordinators and one contracted outreach worker were dedicated to this effort, and an investment of $50,000 was made towards integration funds to help families and individuals transition into their new home. For a population experiencing unsheltered homelessness, <clears throat> the voucher application process can be more than overwhelming. It can be prescriptively preventative to accessing a much-needed voucher. In 2016, a report from Wilder Research identified that most homeless Minnesotans experience a mental illness, chronic health condition, or chemical dependency, and 32% of that population experience at least two co-occurring disorders. These conditions, combined with the additional challenge of being unsheltered homeless, required Metro Transit and Metro HRA to identify policies and processes within our system that traditionally prevented this population from succeeding. By developing a person-centered service delivery approach, Metro Transit Police Department started connecting homeless transit riders to shelter where they could meet with outreach coordinators from Metro HRA 
and complete paperwork alongside an officer they were familiar and comfortable with. Metro HRA additionally created drop-in hours here at our office to allow clients no appointment necessary, low barrier access to a dedicated outreach coordinator that would be assisting them through their housing process. Thanks to these efforts, Metro Transit PD completed over 5,000 unduplicated referrals to shelter in 2019, and Metro HRA, outreach conduct, Metro HRA conducted outreach to 216 individuals, 157 of whom completed program intake. While meeting with clients on transit, in shelter, and at drop-in, outreach coordinators began the pre-move counseling process. During this time, outreach coordinators and clients worked to identify, mitigate, and remove barriers to accessing housing. Clients experiencing homelessness may have difficulty securing housing due to poor credit, negative rental history, or challenging criminal records. <coughs> Mitigating these barriers can entail paying past due utility bills, negotiating a neutral rental reference from a past landlord, expunging evictions, or securing support letters from probation or parole officers. Once we believe the groundwork has been laid to make an application approval probable, we begin searching for housing. Metro HRA has a standing outreach team that is committed to landlord recruitment, allowing the HAT team to access a pool of ready and willing landlords who have available and appropriate units for our clients. The outreach team will assist with showings, transportation, help filling out applications, as well as application and security deposit fee assistance. That averages $504 per client. Thanks to these efforts, Metro HRA assisted with the completion of 120 housing applications for 94 clients, providing a 78% application approval rate for this very hard to house population. Uh, once a voucher has been issued, on average, it takes a HAP participant 35 days to move into their new home. When that time comes, just like with Housing Search, outreach coordinators provide that participant transportation to their move-in appointment, sit with them through their lease signing. One dedicated outreach worker will conduct the participant's housing quality standard inspection and execute all Metro HRA paperwork to help expedite the process. After a family moves into housing, we're committed to continuing with post-move services. Within the first 90 days, families are often referred for furniture. Coordinate, uh, outreach coordinators will plan food shelf visits and assist with school registration. We've committed to case management with all of our clients for at least one year. Continuing with a person-centered approach, we'll meet clients at least once a month or more if it's needed. All of this work allowed us to utilize all 89 vouchers, providing safe, decent, and affordable housing to 101 adults, 65 children, who are no longer sleeping in places not meant for human habitation. <clears throat> uh, we're gonna share with you a few stories. Uh, the power of narrative is immense. <clears throat> and uh, I'd like to first tell you about, uh, more. thank you. Uh, first tell you about a couple that will remain anonymous through this story. Uh, by the time Metro Transit PD had first met this couple, they had, had been experiencing unsheltered homelessness for three years. Most nights, they rode the Green Line, sunset to sunrise, or weather permitting, took shifts, sleeping in bus shelters along Marquette or Nicolette Avenue. Metro Transit PD helped the couple access shelter when the option was available, but the two were unwilling to be separated. She confined to a wheelchair and prone to seizures, and he determined to see to her safety and well-being. With their needs for housing great, Metro Transit PD connected me to the couple after they had checked into shelter for the night. After completing our paperwork and qualifying the couple for a housing choice voucher, I asked them to tell me about their dream home, a question I ask every client when they start searching for housing. The couple shared with me a picture of the home they always hoped to have, something small and easy to clean, a place outside of downtown, but close to a bus line, a bathroom with a tub, she loves to take baths, and of course, they needed an elevator in the building. The couple told me all of this would be great, but they would really take anything, 
because they had challenges on their criminal background and most landlords would not rent to them. The couple had been homeless since he was released from prison for a violation to register as a predatory offender. The challenge that was presented to us was great. Find a landlord to accept his criminal background who also had a handicapped unit available. All this could be done, but it would take time. Maintaining the couple's trust over weeks and months of bad news or no news at all was a challenge. Metro Transit PD officers making consistent contact with the couple overnight and drop in hours at Metro a HRA offices helped the couple stick with us through this process until the day came that we could go to a showing. Through our pre-move counseling, we had completed a background check and collected letters of support from his probation officer. Their potential new landlord had already reviewed these documents, considered their history, and assured that if the couple liked the unit, they'd be accepted. I'm telling you the story because <coughs> they were, they loved their apartment, the neighborhood, the bus stop out front, the elevator and the tub with grab bars. The day they signed their lease, I picked them up from their preferred bus shelter where they abandoned the sign that you see here. We took a trip to their local food shelf where they received 120 pounds of food their first day of housing. The following week, they replaced their air mattress for a king size bed, a whole house full of furniture and paid rent for the first time. We know their story's not over. Moving into housing is just the beginning and maintaining housing is its own unique struggle. Through Metro HRA's commitment to ongoing case management, we will continue to give support to these clients as they struggle and succeed in their new home. Now I get to share our success stories as well. And these are rarely unique <clears throat> success stories because they um, discuss individuals and they both let us, um, we can share their names and their photos. But um, Mr. Mitchell there, who's holding his keys, was homeless before he met us for more than 10 years, 10 plus years. He was living in our shelter right outside um, on 5th in Minnesota, and he had been living inside there for three years, consistently getting trespass orders from um, Metro Transit Police Department because we consistently tell him you can't have all your things here, you have to move along, be catching a bus, you have to have a destination. And finally one day, Tommy, um, Officer Eam just said, hey, we got to take you somewhere. You can't live here. And he just kind of looked at Tommy and he said, okay. And then he looked at Kat and he goes, who's uh, Officer Spear. And uh, he said, well, you'll be my mom and she can be, he can be my dad and you guys will take care of me. We were just kind of like, okay. So we're, we're not sure, but um, we took him to the safe space shelter and he's like, I can't stay here. It's a scary place. I don't feel safe. And Tommy stayed there the whole night with him stood outside while he was on the mattress so that he could get a full night's sleep. After that, he said, we'll come back tomorrow. And we did this for weeks at hand until he finally felt comfortable doing things um, with us. We were finally able to get him into pay for stay at higher ground where he's still there. And so we keep that connection because as we talk about the individuals that we serve, it's not that easy. We would have said that was a great success story. Um, he was there for about five months when Kat happened to be doing another patrol and found him sleeping behind the athletic center. And we were like, why are you here? You have a place. And he's like, I'm scared. And so he had an incident and he didn't have the correct tools to continue um, staying where he was. He'd been paying his rent, but he had this room, he had this housing component, but still had that fear level. So we were able to get him back into his housing, get him restabilized, find him a new caseworker, And we still to this day continue to check on them. As we know, statistics say if someone stays in housing for more than six months, they're, they're more likely to continue to stay in housing. The second picture is Miss um, Dynasty and her five children that we found sleeping on the green lot. And you say, how can somebody ignore that? Um, Dynasty was very sophisticated and looking like she was going somewhere. So no one really um, questioned that, but we had wonderful train and bus operators who called us and said, you know, I've seen her several times and I don't think she's really going anywhere. And um, we're really concerned. We made contact with her and what a motivated woman. She was like, all righty. She pulled out all of her, her documents that she had held close to her, which is a very rare um, thing to have. So birth certificates, social security cards, um, medical history, all of the things that are required 
um, to get housing. And with that, she um, showed up at every appointment with all five children in tow. At every appointment she came and she was, um, we were able to quickly within a month to get her off of the train into a nice side-by-side -side duplex. And we were able to um, provide the kids with bikes from Minneapolis Bike Pops as part of our, our community collaborative. And she recently participated in our first Metro Transit Shop with a Cop with all five of those lovely children making Target rethink they want to have us do Shop with Cops again. <laughs> but it was a great experience that welcome back. And the last picture is something that we're very, very proud of here is our mobile assessment vehicle that we debuted on National Night Out. And what the mobile assessment vehicle, also known as the MAV, and if you were here in the very beginning, it was the Gus bus because it was a decommissioned Metro Mobility bus that we were gifted and, and said, go forth and do things with it. We were able to retrofit it and um, work with Healthcare for Homeless and provide a space where we can do housing assessments, give out survival gear, show up and meet people where they're at, out of those shelters, transport them um, to our safe space, dedicated beds and start that process. Um, as you can see, we had Governor Walls on there and he was very excited about that. We're really working on um, securing identification, working with the Department of Public Safety to take that next step in getting people uh, driver's license, Minnesota state IDs, so they can start the, the process of um, becoming successful individuals and becoming our destination riders. And that's really the biggest thing is that all of these individuals that are utilizing our system, they're our customers. And what we want to do as part of this process is then turn them into destination riders, is that they are using our system to get to their homes. And that's really what we hope to accomplish with HAD and our continued partnership with HRA. So, you know, one more slide, I'm gonna wrap this up, but I think the important part of this whole story is that work like this does not happen when you're doing things a status quo or you're doing things like you've always had them. I mean, this partnership took extreme steps outside of the box, it took creative thinking, it took new ways of doing things, it took engaging people to find out what works for them, and that's why this was successful. It was a new initiative. We had the support of all of you as council members. We had support of the council leadership and this would not have happened without that. Um, I think another important thing is it really, um, it has changed the way Metro HRA, the way we do our work. Um, it has changed the way Metro Transit Police operate and it's working with people towards success and promoting housing stability. And as Ryan indicated, housing stability isn't getting somebody into an apartment and saying, good luck to you. The more difficult part is keeping people housed. And so providing people with the connections and the supports that they need to remain housed becomes the more important part of the, of the scenario. And our goal, we know we're not a social service agency. The Metro HRA, we provide rent assistance. And our, we're not social service providers, nor can we be social service providers. But what we can do is provide these light touch services that our outreach team is providing, and then along the way, get people connected to mainstream resources, whatever those might be for each individual family. And, um, you know, I, I really want to commend Brooke and Ryan um, as outreach workers and as the homeless action team, but I also want to introduce Renee and Tasha and Tammy, who are also part of the HRA outreach team, they worked so, so hard to get these vouchers in place that we thought a year ago, there's no way this is going to happen. And we did it. And it was it's really, really cool. Um, and they're and, still housed. And they're still housed. All of them? We haven't, all of them. One. Mm. One, we one, lost one. One. Um, but this is a national example, too, I think is an important part of the story, not only from a transit perspective and a transit police perspective, but from a housing authority perspective. So these partnerships work. Um, and the HRE was just awarded 67 additional mainstream vouchers um, just in November. Um, and we're dedicating <coughs> some of those, again, to the HAT team, Homeless Action Team, to continue connecting people to housing stability, but then also have a partnership with Anoka and Carver County to connect people with housing stability in those counties. Um, we also, I think collaboration is a big part of this story, which is why I have the Drake Fire as a bullet point on here, is that um, our job, my job as a director of the housing authorities to collaborate with other agencies to serve people. 
whether those people are in Minneapolis in the suburbs, which is where the HRA Housing Authority operates, it doesn't matter. Boundaries mean nothing to people when they're sleeping outside. And so we need to create partnerships with these other agencies to make sure people get connected to housing stability. And uh, um, I'm certain that you all know the Drake fire, very devastating in Minneapolis. 200 people were displaced as a result of that fire. So we're working closely with our colleagues, both the Metro HRA um, and the HAT team with um, the city of Minneapolis, the housing authority, and if there's a role that we can play in providing housing assistance to some of these families um, through the vouchers that we award, are awarded, um, we will do that. Um, you know, I just you know want to just say this is a unique partnership. I'm proud to be part of it, and I um, thank you for your continued support that helps us provide these important services. And we'll answer questions. Any questions, uh, Member Cummings? Thank you, Chair. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to point out too, so last week I rode on the uh, blue line in the cab and had an opportunity to talk with one of the rail operators as well. And I think that their role in this as partners um, needs to be acknowledged as well. Um, that they, the HAT team is fabulous, uh, transit police is terrific, the staff is great, it's all wonderful. But it, again, as you said, it is collaboration. There are many, many partners and certainly our rail and um, bus operators are a part of that equation and sometimes they're in a very challenging situation and I don't mean physically but I mean morally and uh, uh, it's it's challenging but they are clearly partnering and I think we need to acknowledge the role that they play as well because it's really really important and much appreciated it was really interesting to uh, talk with one of the rail operators about his experience and there were some uh, people who were clearly lose, using the train um, as shelter during the day. And so it, it initiated a wonderful conversation we were able to have about the challenges of being an operator and encountering this and what do you do and how do we participate as partners. So I just want to make sure that they're acknowledged as well. Thank you for all that you're doing. Uh, Ms. Barker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to thank all of you for the work that you're doing. I think that I'm so impressed with the collaboration across different entities here at Council and how we're actually seeing some changes out in the system. I particularly want to thank everybody for some of the responses, um, both to Metro Transit and also to Regional Administrator for the outreach that was done um, after the Drake fire. Um, it was a great, uh, I think the foundation had been established with the work with the HRA and the HAT team that made us in a great position to respond to that. Not only were we able to help move people, we were help, help, able to help move some of the donations. Um, we were also able to go out into the community and provide transit passes and things like that to people who needed things in an urgent situation. So really want to thank um, all of you, all the people at Metro Transit um, PD and Metro Transit for the response. But I do think the work that we've done over the last couple of years has really laid that foundation where we were able to respond very quickly. So, thank you. Any other comments, questions? Member Ingrid. Thanks. Um, I wanted to say thank you to your team, um, to um, Sergeant Blake and um, to Ms. Um, Ottenheim Leafheit. Um, I have to say your name well because of my <laughs> name. <laughs> so, long name, sees a long name. And to, of course, um, Terry um, Smith. Um, I don't want to live in a Minnesota where we don't do things this way. I don't want to. And I want to live in a Minnesota where we do this and even more because we can. We absolutely can. And you guys are proof of that. Um, when we have the will, the intent, the um, desire of staff to provide their expertise and their hard work, we can do amazing things. Um, one thing I'd like to um, challenge all of us to is to continuously apply a lens of youth and families to this issue. Um, you guys know I love to spout off some facts and I think it's important to do this. Um, I also want to acknowledge the cross-departmental work within the Met Council and how important that is to the success and, and how that's such a great example that we could 
see in completely unrelated topics, um, that collaboration I think is wonderful and to be commended. That's not always easy inside an organization, so I wanna recognize that. Um, the majority of people experiencing homelessness are youth. 6,000 in Minnesota, specifically on every, every given night are youth. That's the vast majority of that number that we're looking at. Our system relies on separation of fathers and partners in order to stay in supportive housing for homelessness. I don't know that people know that. The story I have and received as a part of some of our experiences was when we closed the green line, there was a family who was at a Culver's on university. And five officers and Joe Nathan, um, some of ours <laughs> and others, tried to get them into some supportive housing and couldn't. So they ended up putting together their personal cash to get them in a hotel. And they were told if the mother said that the father was abusive, they could get her in housing right away. And she refused to do that. Our system is broken beyond just us in this room, beyond our efforts, but that is something that I don't want us to be blind to because fathers and, and male partners are so important. Your story illustrated that. 73% of those 6,000 are indigenous and kids of color. 29% of those youth are 18 to 24. And they can't be and often don't get rented to because they don't have a credit history. They don't have a credit credit. <laughs> they don't have anything. So there's structurally something that prevents them from getting a space. And I wonder if that's an opportunity where maybe we can do something differently and have an impact on them. 44% of those are waiting for Section 8 or, uh, or aren't able to get on the waiting list because it's closed during periods of time. <laughs> so I just want us to challenge ourselves to, when we're doing the work that we do across our departments, to think about and look at the data that helps us inform what is the experience for people under 18 and what's the experience for people 18 to 24 because these are populations we often don't see. I also want to extend an invitation to for my day hat <laughs> um, to help build stronger philanthropic public partnerships um, around this work. Um, we're at Youth Park and many other foundations involved, especially on youth homelessness, but in particular around the Drake um, opportunity um, wanting to um, get engaged and, and supportive and beyond that. I got a number of calls um, related to um, youth shelters experiencing challenges because of the train changes. So I think we just need to reach out to them and think of that. I'd love to hear more about if there are other barriers, like the ones I mentioned that you've learned about that we could know about and have apply our various resources to bear on them. And I'd also like to share, someone shared this with me that in Canada, there's a right to housing law that got enacted. Um, and some of the cost benefit analysis either we save a half or three-fourths of what we spend on homelessness by providing housing. So with that, I'll turn it over to a response on the other barriers or ideas. Council member, uh, thank you for thank you, your Chair. information. And I just want to let you know that we are actually cutting edge. We were able to house 10 um, American Indian youth indigenous between right. the ages of 18 and 24 with our collaborative partnership with Ada Young, and we continue to right. do that. We also, the MTPD Homeless Action Team is also in work with uh, Youth Link in Minneapolis. And when the um, train shutdown occurred, we partnered with uh, Youth Link um, to help them pilot their program of having their uh, um, drop-in center open overnight, and they were awarded $700,000 from the Frey Foundation to, pro to do that coming up here starting in about two weeks, and we're going to be partnering with them. We utilized the MAV and took it out and um, met with their outreach workers along with our PAC team members out on 5th and Hennepin and the warehouse platform where we get a majority of our 
calls as well as where the young adults are at as well as Chicago Lake and Franklin Station basically looking for those young adults that you know do get missed because it's considered couch hopping or they don't do those certain things so we're very aware and that was part of the training working with street works and things so we are very um, aware of those issues and have been working with housing to address those and be very intentional in our um, approach as far as metro hra and hat for those very specific things as well as um, sex trafficking and other things that come out of what happens with um, homeless and unsheltered young people utilizing our train system for housing. So we are well aware, thank you for bringing that, and we continue to work with our partners in addressing those issues. Thank you. Hey, Mark. Member Lee. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I've been uh, silently weeping up here through your, uh, your presentation. Um, and it's taking every bone in my body not to openly weep. Um, some of us have been poor and, and uh, homeless up here ourselves. And when we become policymakers up here, we don't forget where we come from. Um, and so this, this is a great thing you guys are doing, and I want to commend the staff. Um, I appreciate you, the use of your language, uh, meeting people where they're at. In my day job, we talk about our work in community as we see relationships moving at the speed of trust. And we have to go to meet people where they're at. Um, that's how we're accessible and that's how we work together. Um, oftentimes government is bureaucratic, but, but when we work together, we really solve problems. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I toured the um, Dorothy Day and Catholic Charities Center when they just opened and uh, President CEO Tim Marks took us on a tour. And he was telling us about some of the barriers that Councilmember Alice, uh, Alice, um, Atlas Ingerbritson talked about, and he told us a really heartbreaking story about a couple. Um, uh, some, because of the demographics, some shelters segregate the genders, um, and some are just exclusively one gender. And so this couple, um, they would go to a shelter, and there, there might be more bed for men and less for women. And if she gets turned away that night, he tells her, if you can't find shelter, then fake a stomach ache, go to the ER, you'll get, you'll be in a safe place for the night. And that story broke my heart. And I also, I'm oh, sorry, I was at the St. Paul College Foundation Gala, and the president told me that close to half of their students are homeless. Mm -hmm. And Dorothy Day lived through the great San Francisco earthquake of 1906 when she was eight years old. And after that event, poverty and death is the great equalizer, right? The next morning, bankers and poor tenants find themselves on the streets eating together under rubble. And after that great San Francisco earthquake, she dedicated her life to service and to housing people. That's why I come in your work and thank you. I'm done, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Member Lillegrand. No, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just want to add my thanks to the work that the three presenters are doing and the teams that are working with them. It's just phenomenal work. It's innovative. It's out of the box. In the work that I do during the day, I get to see the uh, results of the work that these folks are doing. <clears throat> it's just, it's amazing. And uh, to lay on some more facts, the uh, number of people experiencing unsheltered homelessness in our region has doubled since 2015. Uh, it's an accelerating trend line. We're at a point now in this region that unless there is successful and sustainable intervention, that line is likely to accelerate so quickly it'll go almost vertical and we'll get to a point where there's really nothing we can do to address it. So these kinds of activities and interventions are, are critical in my <clears throat> involvement this was never an issue that I thought I would be greatly involved in, but with the appearance of the Franklin Hiawatha encampment in 2018, which was literally, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, some relief kind of got me going, <laughs> that, which was literally outside my office and really right in the Native community. And, and since then, I've just been, had uh, profound uh, experiences and sort of attitude changes, and my involvement is up constant now in, in this issue. And... <clears throat> I'm very fortunate to see out in the community the HAT team, the mobile assessment vehicle. And, uh, and one of the things that I just marveled at, and I know my colleagues here have heard me say this a number of times, but how because of the high visibility of the Franklin Hiawatha encampment or the wall of God and natives, as we call it, in the community, 
there was a broad and systemic shift in the approach to unsheltered homelessness and really a comprehensive approach where all of the stakeholders came together to try to do better. And, and uh, through the Minnesota Interagency Council on Homelessness, there's been a very strong effort to try to regionalize the response to unsheltered homelessness. And, uh, and it's not something anyone does. And Terry said it really well, you know, we're not a social service agency. And uh, when my uh, involvement because of the Franklin Hiawatha encampment started, I was a community person. I have a number of roles out in the community. I chair the Metropolitan Urban Indian Directors. And then since then I have become a Met Council member. And so this role in regionalizing uh, this response has been really personal and professional to me, but uh, <clears throat> what was really frustrating at the community level as we were trying to deal with response was to help people say, we don't do that, we don't do that, and really trying to divvy up the roles. And I think how, what, how Terry described our activities of saying, okay, what do we do, and how can that be adapted to, uh, to be a more effective, um, to be more effective in our response, I think is really the right attitude. And so is with our first conversation, our col my colleagues will remember this, our first conversation about the 2020 budget, there was talks about putting resources towards unsheltered homelessness. When most jurisdictions were saying, well, how much is that jurisdiction putting in? How much are they putting in? We stepped in to the resource question. We had a little bit of a, uh, advanced work on the regionalization due to putting uh, directed efforts into those who are sheltering on uh, the light rail trains. And, and then the camp really added energy to that. and interest and so we stepped in with other you know, changes in programming redirecting other resources with the mobile assessment vehicle and so it's been really uh, i've been really proud i'm glad you used that word today that you're proud of your work because i've been proud of the council that we haven't stepped back we have stepped into this conversation and and really led by example and uh, council member alice engerbertson brings up the idea of a public private partnership those are forming now as well the, in response to the waltz Flanagan administration call for action to bring more people inside the creation of the minnesota homeless fund which will be getting money out imminently into solutions and the, uh, one thing and sergeant blakely you've really hit on this a lot but the idea that it's people-centered community-based <laughs> the the broad acceptance that uh People who are experiencing unsheltered homelessness know what they need, and it's our responsibility to listen to them and then to adapt our approach and our resources to those community-centered, people-centered uh, responses. It's, I've never seen anything like it. I've said that a lot in my life as an activist, as a uh, uh, as an elected official, as a community worker. I've never seen a whole system all stakeholders come together and figure out, try to figure out how to do better. And so I'm really, I'm really proud of the work that we're, that we're doing here and that we'll continue to do and, and that the system is changing. And what my hope is that if we can come together in this way to address this challenge, why can't we do that in other areas? And what kind of a model can this be in our, in our work? So thrilled to be part of it. I want to recognize you're our heroes tonight. Uh, it's just remarkable stories, and you've clearly hit a chord with, I think, all of us, um, that these are statistics we can all read about and see, but you've told actual stories. And those stories and those narratives are ones that we all can identify with in some way. I might, not my day job, my last job, um, I got very intimately engaged in the Franklin Hiawatha uh, issue because MnDOT was the essentially kind of uh, the landowner. Mm -hmm. But I think we shifted even to Minda from, because I had a map of the entire metro area of the 150 encampments, not just the most visible one, but that is so often in our midst. Mm -hmm. And to realize that uh, there was a idea that, well, our job is to keep the right away safe, so we'll just clean it out. It's like, you can't just do that. We are all responsible in some way to be both compassionate but more importantly, to collaborate. And I think what we, uh, just echoing what Member Lilligren has described, that the idea of knowing what your area responsibility is and how you work in collaboration with social services, with local uh, law enforcement, with Youth Link, and with others. I mean, it sounds like you're modeling this idea that we all have our jurisdiction. And yes, we're not a social agency, but we're also not blind to that we have some responsibility and how do we work with others who do have the responsibility so people truly people aren't falling through the cracks so 
uh, you've inspired us not only in this work, but as uh, I'll echo the thought that it uh, tells us when Minnesota is doing its best and our region is doing its best, it's acting in that kind of thoughtful way. Uh, member Bento. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. It, I would like to suggest that it might be a great idea to arrange a meeting with the members of the Minnesota congressional delegation and or their staffs um, here in the state to share this information. I, I just think it's crucially crucial that they know about this and they understand the role that the, that HUD and HUD's support with the 89 vouchers plays and the fact that 89 vouchers isn't enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, they don't have magic wands in their pockets, but they can, they, they can help. And I think it would be good for them to be well versed on this. I'd also like to suggest that, and maybe Council Member Cummings, you know, or, or Meredith, does does um, Commissioner Ho and her agency do they do any kind of statewide or regional sort of um, pulling together of the the faith communities, the foundations, the corporations, the nonprofits, local and county and state government? players who have pieces of the puzzle that are needed to really kind of get our heads wrapped thoroughly around homelessness. And if not, could we suggest it and maybe partner with, with her agency and, and really try to address it? Because it, it's not confined to the metro boundaries. It's not confined to Maplewood's boundaries or Minneapolis's boundaries. And um, it's deeply affecting everybody. Christmas Day was a downer, not <laughs> definitely for the people affected by the fire and the first responders. But I'll tell you, it was the subject of conversation for quite a while with my family that day, and I didn't even bring it up. So um, um, they usually blame me for being the Debbie Downer at gatherings. <laughs> but, um, and that's not meant to badmouth Debs. Mm -hmm. Sorry, <laughs> Commissioner. <laughs> I mean, council member. You're but I just, I just think that to the extent that we can help pull all of the partnerships together, it would be really helpful. I think sharing best practices, um, sharing just what we've learned, all of that would be really helpful. And there is the, um, inter, the state interstate oh, sure. interagency partnership on homelessness. And, and Terry is a member, and Robert, and and it does bring all of those factions together and then there there have been subcommittees made because it ma makes them more nimble then to be able to address some of the things but it, it's critically important that all of those um, partners are involved philanthropy and business and social service and legislative and housing and all of them come together on a regular basis and then also work um, separately, maybe you want to add to that too, Ms. Smith. Mr. Chair, if I may. Yes. Um, council members, I, I think, you know, something Kathy Tenbrook has said, she's the director of the Office mm -hmm. of Prevention and Homelessness in Minnesota, Assistant Commissioner of Minnesota Housing, who convenes this group that Robert was talking about and that Council Member Cummings is uh, referencing. But what's unique in that, she's been working in this homeless realm for many, many, many years. And like Robert said, this kind of collaboration and getting all these important people in the room at one time is unprecedented and it's um, a good time to take advantage of that and that's when you can make real progress and um, I've heard her say that time and time again in meetings so I think that's an important thing to point out to your point council member Vento we can each play our piece but if we can play them together then we can move this problem a whole lot I think that um, Ending veterans homelessness is a good example of that. We're so very close in our state to ending veteran homelessness. If we can end it for veterans, we can end it for other mm -hmm. populations, and, and this is how we do it. Uh, um, we had one comment from Member Alex. Chair, um, I, I was right with um, Council Member Vento and in, in, in wondering with maybe a little <coughs> bit of a tweak. I'm thinking about 
something that I feel like has been a tenor of this council and our conversations is about really having a regional view on all of the things we do and really thinking right. about that. Um, and, and it is not just a metro area issue, it's a statewide issue and oftentimes greater Minnesota um, is, is invisible um, on this. So I, I don't want to imply that, but I wonder about the opportunity too of just having policy makers come together. <laughs> to um, to learn about what's happening interagency, so we can really be supportive of the work of of staff, um, and also um, build accountability. and And I appreciate hearing from everybody today that we recognize social work isn't what we do, but this isn't just about social work. We are. People aren't living in this situation because they have somehow failed at life. Our system has been set up for certain folks to succeed and certain situations to succeed, and we aren't resilient. I was trying to help a young person navigate their um, um, health insurance to find mental health, and I realized there wasn't even a drop down for mental health in their health insurance. You know, so there are systematic ways that we make things really difficult for people to be successful. So I just, that maybe is a little tweak. I'm wondering, um, is it hosting and really owning the benefits of being a regional body is supporting our local small communities that might be facing these things and don't have the resources. And maybe it's both an aspirational conversation and opportunity to share practices and, and, and ideate with each other. We may, we may be uh, interested in hearing from uh, Kathy Tenbrook just to hear uh, so we mm -hmm. have a greater understanding mm -hmm. of this larger puzzle as we've suggested. Maybe find some great. time to, to hear that. Uh, I know, That's Member great. Johnson, did you have a? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first of all, thank you. Um, one thing that I've learned in my almost a year here at Met Council is the uh, depth of work that takes place, but the humility um, by which you um, execute on the work. Um, you're really in the service mode, um, taking care, um, and uh, I just don't think throughout this region people really understand how you are um, meeting people where they're at and what we're trying to um, accomplish. And I think when I say that, it goes back to comments that were already made, is making sure that all of the partnerships that are coming together amplify those stories for our congressional delegation and for legislative leadership, chairs of committees and local leaders, especially where issues are happening. Um, and then in my day job uh, at Prosperity's Front Door, we are an outcome of Minnesota's housing task force. Now, homelessness is uh, important and it's a spectrum of housing, right? So I won't get into the whole thing tonight, but we are short housing at every level, mm -hmm. and it is the underpinning of everything that matters to a human being. And one of the goals in my work, in my day job, is to help bring along the private sector in this too. Uh, there's a lot of government work on this, but um, the private sector, especially through the governor's recent leadership um, around homelessness, is getting them to understand that um, there, there is a moment in time before Minnesota really experiences this crisis like others are around the country, where we can, to Councilmember Lilligren's point, get ahead of this before it spikes. Um, and so however we in our role can partner as we are, um, but also elevate this to partners who maybe aren't at the table yet. And so in my day job, I'm working with the chambers and you know, Itasca is looking at this and of course, Greater MSP. Um, and I say all the time, this is a moral imperative, but also it's an economic imperative. Um, and it really foretells, uh, I think internally as people, human beings, one-to-one, -one, but externally, what do we want the state to be as we try to solve the world's greatest challenges and we can start with our own. So I um, just bring whatever I can to the table in this too um, and hope that we can somehow elevate uh, this work so people feel it in their heart like we are tonight because when you get to people at that level, you'll bring in the new partnerships you need and I'm trying to do whatever I can do. So I'm just very grateful. I'm just so grateful for everything you're doing and um, it's great to be part of this team. Thank you. And... Uh... Thank you all for the passion and the interest, and uh, I don't know, I'll speak for myself. For a first meeting, this is really interesting for, at many levels, and it's great to see the passion and the interest and the actual results of your great work. Mm -hmm. So, um, I know uh, to follow up on uh, Member Johnson, uh, one of Greater MSP's uh, and the TASCA Projects initiative is looking at housing 
um, with a very broad lens, and we are facing a crisis, and, and we in this council uh, are, own a piece of that. So mm -hmm. uh, we'll certainly want to have a chance, at least from my point of view, to get more informed and thoughtful about how we can play that role. Any other questions, thoughts? Yes. Oh, uh, member. Thank you, Mr. Coming. Chair. Um, I know Council Member Vento has suggested, and perhaps others have too, that per, that there might be an opportunity for uh, whoever can to ride the rails and uh, see firsthand. So, if that can be arranged, especially, I think Sergeant Blakey, you said that earlier, especially during the winter weather when it, we can really experience firsthand, I would really be interested in that. So, if we can get something like that set up, that would be wonderful. Sure, anytime. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Well, then, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time, and uh, we will, uh, as they say, in touch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're going to hear uh, now a quarterly report uh, from Jim Alexander uh, on the Southwest Light Rail Project, my favorite light rail project. Uh, <laughs> and um, uh, I look forward to hearing your update. All right, thank you, Chair. Uh, Sam O'Connor yeah, joining me real. here. I'm uh, Jim Alexander, Project Director for Southwest LRT. You all know me. We were looking to give you uh, an update uh, last uh, December to make our quarterly, but uh, due to agendas filling up, we, uh, we're, we're here today. And so I have a number of slides to talk about, and then we'll have uh, uh, Tracy Jackson and John Bang come up and talk about uh, DD Force uh, related to the project. Uh, so uh, just to get started, we'll just do our project update that I've, that I've been giving you over the past uh, uh, quarters here and uh, talk about where we are with 2019. We, uh, we really got started on, uh, on getting construction. So we are really becoming real out there, if you will. Um, this is our schedule that, that's kind of fairly high level. A lot of acronyms up there. I did put the, uh, the labels down below. Um, so the record decision, the administrative, or the, uh, uh, the amended record decision, and this LOMP is recalled the, the LOMP letter of no prejudice. That's a that's essentially a vehicle that the FTA uses to uh, allow us to uh, spend monies during construction, and they would be eligible. Those monies to be eligible for uh, that cost share once we get the FFGA. And I wanted to talk about that a little bit here. We're in 2020 now, and uh, we are looking at that uh, full funding grant agreement. Uh, in fact, I just had some conversations with FTA staff today, and uh, the things are in the works on that uh, full funding grant agreement. They're still looking at the documentation we provided in August to them and, uh, and uh, providing uh, responses to comments they've had, and uh, we're anticipating uh, getting some paperwork on the FFGA soon. Uh, in terms of the roadmap, we, uh, we are hopeful that uh, we'll get that FFGA uh, toward the end of this quarter. Um, we'll have to see how things go. A lot of things happening in Washington, D.C., as you've probably been hearing. So, um, but uh, that's, that's where we're currently sitting right now. So we, we uh, continue to meet with uh, FTA on a monthly basis, at least, to talk about uh, the project and the FFGA status. The other piece, uh, we will have an update on uh, light rail vehicles. Uh, those are moving along. Uh, we got uh, two vehicles uh, nearly all assembled, and so I'll show you some photos of that. And then uh, fare collection is still out a bit. Um, we're going to leverage off of some other projects uh, with the orange line and and uh, to get the fare collection for this project. And then uh, integration testing is a common thing that we have to do. Once we get all the pieces put together, we do a lot of testing with our operations folks to make sure that uh, it, uh, it, it works in a safe environment. And then, of course, revenue service in 2023. So major milestones, there's really a lot of things I could put on this slide, but just to kind of sum it up from a uh, kind of more of the administrative pieces, we uh, issued uh, a couple of letter no, uh, limited notice proceeds to the civil contractor, London McCrossan uh, Joint Venture, uh, to keep them rolling and those are tied with those LOMPs that we've been getting from uh, from the feds. And uh, we also submitted the FFGA docs, docs as I indicated in August. Um, we received uh, a letter of no prejudice number two from FTA to keep civil and the systems contract. We'll talk about that a little bit in a, in a couple of slides. We awarded that contract earlier in the fall and then uh, issued another LNTP for, uh, for the civil. And then uh, we have the Franklin O&M contract. We issued the invitation for bids. We're anticipating getting bids on that uh, on that contract uh, here later this month. 
and we uh, we awarded and actually the the contract for SCADA, that's the that's the re really the vehicle that uh, that provides the communication with all the stuff the system is going to be putting in, make sure that the uh, rail uh, operators and operations can see what's going on out in the uh, along the line, and so that that contract will be uh, getting a limited notice proceed here shortly. On the real estate front. Uh, uh, I think these are pretty close numbers I reported to you last time uh, in terms of the total parcels, 191. And this is a, a sum of uh, either full acquisitions or, or temporary easements or just uh, partial takes that we needed for the project that were identified during the environmental review process. We also have some public parcels. Those are all done, and so those with the, uh, the local jurisdictions and the, uh, the cities and the county. And then private parcels, 149 there. We have uh, essentially uh, uh, 61 of those. It's all complete. We have uh, we have full uh, acquisition and the rest remain. We have the title and possession so we can give the contractor the, uh, the, the room to work on those, on those areas, but uh, we're still finalizing uh, going through settlements. Some are going through commissioners <coughs> through the condemnation process. But uh, things are things are moving along really well, and uh, there really aren't any <coughs> big issues with uh, real estate at this juncture. The other the other side of this is there are relocations. We have we had a high number, 177, reported to you in the past. Though so those are all essentially uh, done now, but uh, there's some administrative pieces. Um, we have 149 that are completely done. There's five displacees that. Uh, have not uh, necessarily concurred with our final determination. And there is a process that goes through an administrative law judge to determine if they're, uh, if we're missing something. Just so, so you're aware, we, we follow state and uh, federal law and we have advisors from MnDOT, we have advisors and consultants to, uh, to uh, guide us on this relocation process. So we feel pretty solid with uh, our process that we have in place. And then we have 23 uh, claims that are still being finalized. Um, but uh, things are moving along pretty well on that front as well. I might just pause there before I get into pictures if there's any questions on uh, on what I've covered so far. Any questions so far? All right. Keep going. Okay, so construction activities. Uh, we're gonna, we're gonna um, continue to provide these updates on what's being built out there. We have a lot of things that we are building, 29 total bridges. Uh, 15 of those bridges are underway, mostly in the uh, foundation work. A lot of, a lot of uh, uh, piles being installed for the foundations and piers going up. So if you haven't been out on the alignment any portions, you'll start seeing things sprouting up out of the ground a little bit. And would offer if uh, if uh, you all are interested in, in any type of tour, we'd be more than happy to uh, take you out to uh, to see. We have an invite to the chair to to introduce him to. Uh, to uh, the, the 14 and a half miles we have. And so we uh, looked, uh, we'll certainly welcome that. Uh, tunnels, we have eight tunnels. Uh, most of those are pedestrian. There are two, two, uh, two of the big, bigger tunnels we've talked about in the past under uh, Highway 62. That work is underway and, uh, and the Kenilworth uh, and the Kenilworth Corridor, we've talked about that as well. Uh, other, other activities, Blake Road, there's pedestrian um, a tunnel that's going under Blake Road. That's well underway. I've got an image of that. And there's a, a smaller pedestrian uh, tunnel at uh, Louisiana Station. As far as the stations go, we have 16 total stations that uh, we'll have in the project, and four uh, of those stations are underway for construction. And then building demos, we have a total of 15. You can see the, uh, the status there. And retaining walls, it's a big number. We have 130 all told, and uh, 24 are underway at this juncture. Questions? Yes, Mr. Chair, Council Member. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, this um, fall, as a part of the Metropolitan Parks and Open Space Commission work of the council, we've done a number of tours. And one of the things we came across over and over again, because of um, climate change and the large amount of water we've been experiencing is more and more pedestrian tunnels that are not usable because the water levels are higher than people had planned for, like way, way, like you just wouldn't have, plan wouldn't have ever planned for them to be at the levels they are in a number of locations. So I'm just kind of curious, um, is that a part of the planning for these pedestrian tunnels um, to really kind of be mindful that we're experiencing wetter and wetter 
years here and the, the ability to manage that because it was very unfortunate. Some of them were fairly new pedestrian tunnels um, and just completely unusable um, due to sure. un completely unforeseen water. Sure, uh, Mr. Chair, Council Member, that, that is certainly a factor we take a look at. In fact, uh, during the design phase, we really had to kind of uh, say no in some cases because the water was too high to, to really make it feasible to do that. And uh, so it's something we did study in depth. And uh, yeah, I can tell you at the, at the Kenilworth, uh, we, we actually have years and years of, of groundwater data that we've collected since we were in that preliminary stage for quite a bit longer than we anticipated. We have a lot of data to tell us, uh, and it fluctuates, you know, we see about six feet of uh, differential between uh, where it was really dry versus where it's been wet. It has been quite a, quite a bit uh, wet this past year. It's a very high, uh, high moisture year, and uh, down in the Opus area, for example, the groundwater is up. And but we still have designs that would uh, look to accommodate that. So I think we're I think we're okay. But uh, one place where we really hopefully don't have to worry about it right now is the 62 tunnel. That uh, groundwater level is quite uh, down uh, below the uh, mm -hmm. below the tunnel tunnel surface at mm -hmm. that at that location. But okay. we do have groundwater uh, just about everywhere. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. All right. Okay, so I get to show off some images here. I was actually, I did a little tour myself over the weekend and uh, got here a little late out to Southwest Transit, but this is the temporary waiting facility that uh, is being built. And you'll see kind of in the shadows off to the right is where uh, Southwest Transit formerly occupied. That was where their office was located. And they have a passenger waiting area in that first level. And so part of our agreement with Southwest Transit is we will, before we demo that building to accommodate the station platform in the park and ride uh, facility we'll, we'll be putting in, we need to build a temporary facility. And so this is uh, that facility. We look to have this occupied uh, later this month. And so we'll start demoing the, uh, the existing building, but uh, this is starting to, starting to take shape. We actually uh, took advantage of about the last day they're placing asphalt to, uh, to lay some uh, ground so they can, uh, we can uh, uh, handle the bus uh, traffic through here because bus traffic will continue during construction. And I would just say uh, that uh, things are going well down the Southwest Transit. I think it's fair to say that, uh, you know, I, I, don't know, you know, I think Len Semich would say that, uh, you know, things are being coordinated down there pretty well. We've uh, really tried to make an effort because they're running buses down there and we have such a tight area with the construction that we've been really trying to be mindful of, uh, of their operations. <coughs> Uh, so we're going to continue going uh, eastward to our typical here, but this is a kind of the other side. This is a more of a daytime shot with uh, a large retaining wall, and this is uh, essentially north of where you just saw the uh, last image. And I would point out this kind of new feature where we're putting a map up in the upper upper right corner so you can kind of figure out where we are because this alignment is a little bit of a challenge uh, to, to find yourself sometimes. So this retaining wall is well underway. It'll be completed here fairly soon. It runs along uh, 212 just behind it uh, there. And uh, so work is going well there. This is uh, just, uh, just uh, east of that uh, waiting area. Um, this is a, a place called Element. It's a new apartment building where we're building around that. It was, it was built in anticipation of LRT. These are, so this is a pier for the bridge that's gonna go over technology. Uh, uh, road, which is just right in front of you in the foreground there, and Prairie Center Drive off to the right. Further uh, getting up on the hill, if you will, where the water tower is, this is just uh, just uh, west of the water tower in Eden Prairie, the uh, a retaining wall that uh, was built. This is near the uh, Prairie, Prairie Center or the Eden Prairie Town Center station that will be built. Uh, a lot of uh, snowy pictures here. This is uh, progressing over 212 is in the background there. This is the Valley View flying cloud area where we're building a bridge that goes over uh, the ramp that uh, comes from uh, Valley View over onto 212. And we're going to progress our way off to the right into the Golden Triangle area, which is uh, this location here. This is the one of the first stations that's gone up. We have a lot of piles in this location. Um, this is the Golden Triangle Station Foundation that's underway. And then as we uh, continue on, there's another station, uh, downtown Hawkins Station, that's well underway. So we're looking to, uh, contractors to start building up on these structures as we uh, start progressing into the into the winter here. We, and I would speak about that uh, 
you know, as we get into the winter months and uh, we're full into it today, as everybody experienced a little chilly out there, contractor will continue to work, but it'll be a much uh, more moderated uh, um, um, approach is, uh, you know, it's just a little cold out there to get, uh, get the typical production you'd see during the summertime, but work will continue. Uh, this is a bit of an effort for uh, 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 shifting the track at Excelsior Boulevard. This uh, was moved, moved to be done to uh, accommodate an LRT bridge that will go over the uh, Excelsior Boulevard and uh, progress to the uh, east. And uh, I mentioned the uh, pedestrian tunnel, so you kind of get a picture of uh, kind of the mass of what's going on here. Uh, this is a, this, these are uh, uh, sheet piles, those vertical elements, and there's uh, there's uh, what's called uh, whalers on the side there and struts going across those big round tubes. And that's essentially to hold up the earth so things can uh, withstand, uh, things can stay in place, the contractor can do their work and kind of dig the hole and place, this will be eventually placed with concrete. So uh, I was mentioning about the groundwater and it, concerned this this area does have groundwater that's fairly fairly shallow so we will have a, a pumping system to uh, to deal with uh, with the groundwater at this location only during construction pardon only during construction or? Uh, mr. chair a little bit actually a permanent system oh, okay yes so both uh, this is a uh, uh, some bridge work. Uh, we essentially, if you look down the corridor at the Bass Lake Spur uh, in Hopkins and St. Louis Park, we'll have a trail on the north side, freight in the middle, and LRT on the south, where freight is currently on the south side. So the contractor's building bridges for the the the, uh, the trail and the freight freight uh, tracks. And uh, once that's all built, they'll they'll take apart the existing bridge. The freight is running on and move the freight on to the new bridge and uh, we'll build LRT bridge on to, uh, off to the right. Here's uh, this is a good picture. I kind of get a, a sense of that. So you see the uh, in the middle of Louisiana there, you see the piers for the trail bridge uh, closest to us and then the uh, the freight the freight bridge and then the bridge is existing that'll eventually come out and be replaced by an LRT bridge. And this is a pedestrian tunnel, or sorry, pedestrian bridge that goes over Beltline in St. Louis Park. And uh, they're uh, well along here building the piers and they're starting to do some decking work on these uh, at this location. So this is an interesting feature. We've talked a lot about the Kenilworth uh, tunnel in the past. Uh, this is what's called a press-in piler. <coughs> um, we inspect this uh, some time ago in the project and essentially if you have the right soil conditions, you can use this device to essentially hydraulically press the sheets in rather than using vibratory means. And we needed to do this because we're going very close by some, some structures and we need to have uh, a very minimal vibration through this part. And so the contractor is, uh, is working on this. They actually just imported a second machine. So they'll have two of these uh, type machines that will be working on, uh, on the press-in piling effort. So eventually this, uh, this tunnel image will be showing something like we showed at Lake um, in the near term here. And then we uh, progress over the, the channel uh, between uh, Cedar Lake and Lake of the Isles in Minneapolis. And this is uh, the, the freight bridge. They started doing some decking on this, uh, some, some beams to start out going across the channel. And uh, that work uh, continues through the winter here. Off to the left will be a, uh, eventually be a, uh, an LRT bridge and then a freight uh, a trail bridge further to the left. Uh, this is, I uh, kind of want to include this. This is over by Glenwood uh, to kind of show you the, uh, just the complexity of <coughs> that are going on in this project that uh, need to be dealt with. We have a very tight corridor in what's called the YZ sub owned by BNSF. And uh, we need to, need to have a centrally um, move their duct bank. And so what essentially this is, it's a, it's a big duct that's uh, concrete built some, some time ago. It needs to essentially be scooted over, if you will. And so the contractor has, uh, has put some apparatus in there to actually kind of inch it over to, to a closer to our, uh, to the forefront here to make room for, uh, for the freight that gets moved to accommodate LRT. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of busy there. And lastly, last image, wanted to take this uh, get a little advertisement for Metro Transit there. Uh, this is pier work for a, uh, a bridge that will be going, eventually going up and over, uh, um, uh, over 55 to, to, uh, to link in the target field. So that work has just, just got underway uh, in December.
So in terms of construction look ahead, uh, you know, we're essentially going to be working along the 14 and a half miles uh, with uh, kind of the highlights, uh, continuing to work on stations. And, uh, and we, we anticipate the large part of the freight track uh, will be completed and they'll start getting into LRT track. Essentially, the way this uh, all works out is the freight needs to be moved out of the way in many locations before we can do the LRT. So that's why the freight is coming first. And then Southwest Transit, uh, of course, they'll be operating out of that temporary waiting facility while uh, the uh, the station and the, and the park and ride, we have a 450 stall park and ride that we'll be building down there, the ramp that we'll be building. So that'll be get, getting constructed as well. Again, our tunnel will, com will be uh, continuing on and uh, we'll have freight bridges completed on that vast lake spur, essentially that stretch between Hopkins and St. Louis Park, and then in the Kenilworth corridor that I showed earlier. So maybe I'll pause there again if there are any questions on uh, the construction piece. Member Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm sorry for the dumb question, but where is the staging area for all of these uh, materials? Oh, very good, Mr. Chair, Council Member. Very good question. Uh, the, many places. Um, we have, uh, we have locations uh, located throughout the corridor, frankly. Uh, is that starting at Southwest Transit, there are areas where the contractors uh, staging materials. We have, uh, we have a couple of sites on, in, in Hopkins slash Minnetonka where we have a, a demo. I don't know if you know about the Hopkins, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the tech center near 17th and Excelsior, that's a, that's a pretty big site. So they'll be using that for a temporary storage. There's also uh, south of that where they have, uh, if you go out through where our, near our field office is out near KTEL, uh, the contractor has this uh, big mountain of soil out there right now. It's right next to nearby the railroad tracks. And then as we continue on into, uh, into uh, St. Louis Park, there's a belt line, there's a, there's a rather significant area that we're uh, contractor staging materials. And then as we progress into Minneapolis, they have a batch plant that they've, uh, they've constructed uh, near the Van White Boulevard uh, 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 roadway. And uh, so we essentially use this being a linear project is very challenging to have locations of where you can store materials with the contractors making it do. Thanks. Member Champlis. Um, thank you, Chair. I've got a question about the um, temporary waiting area for the yes. Southwest uh, Transit operation. What are you going to do with that temporary shelter when the permanent shelter is complete or the waiting area is complete? Well, that's a very good question, uh, Chair Council Member. I don't know if I can really speak to the materials of what is planned for that. I couldn't uh, talk to that, but it is going to be temporary because this will end up being occupied by other things eventually, and uh, we'll have uh, we'll have a we'll have an area where folks will be driving into the ramp, and then also also accessing for you know people people staging to to pick up and drop off passengers. But I would need to research in terms of how the materials are being resourced after after it was uh, after it's going to be demoed, so to speak. Okay, I'm just curious. I'm sure it will come up as things kind of progress. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. All right. So we'll get back to. Uh... So I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, light rail vehicles. That contract has been moving along. We signed a contract with Siemens back uh, late in, uh, in uh, 2016, and uh, that was in anticipation that we would be in revenue service sooner than the 2023. And so we really couldn't stop that contract because of, of uh, essentially money. We, we would be exposed to more exposure there. So we kept Siemens going in terms of producing vehicles. And it's not a bad thing because uh, operations is, uh, is gonna be uh, underway with a uh, kind of a rehab program on their type ones, the bombardiers, the, the vehicles we, we got initially on the, for the Iowatha, the blue line. And so these vehicles will start, uh, start filling that void, if you will, as they come in. But uh, uh, so far there are 27 girder sets, essentially the frame of the, of the structure and car shells are well underway. This is all work that's uh, being done in Sacramento, California, and we have inspection out there. We actually have a couple of inspectors that are from operations that are out there uh, full time to make sure that these things are getting built uh, according to our specifications. And I report to you that things are going going pretty well on this uh, on this contract. 
Uh, they're also some doing some final assembly, as we'll show in these two images. Uh, this is LRV 301, this is the first vehicle that we'll be receiving uh, sometime here in the first quarter. And it's going through uh, continuity testing as we speak uh, to make sure that everything is going to be working. There's a lot of tests that have to go underway with these vehicles. And uh, not only at the plant, but once they get here, uh, they go through a rigorous uh, uh, amount of testing by our operations folks as well. And we'll have Siemens folks on hand to address uh, issues that uh, may come up as these vehicles get delivered. The other vehicle that's uh, that's well along is LRV 302, and this is uh, ready for install of the uh, the roof assembly to essentially the catenary uh, pieces on top of the uh, the vehicle. So maybe I'll pause briefly there if there are any questions on vehicles. All right. Yeah. Okay. Systems contract. I think it, uh, we uh, we had this uh, before you last fall in terms of awarding, but. Uh, just kind of a make it official presentation here. We've uh, we've awarded and given uh, limited notice proceed to Aldrich Parsons, a joint venture, for just under two hundred million dollars for these systems elements, and uh, that is really made up of all these pieces. Uh, essentially, the traction power is really the the things that run the train and the communications that are tied with that. So that SCADA that I mentioned, that kind of that kind of joins on to the systems contract. In fact, on uh, on the central corridor, there, there was one contract. We decided to separate that out because we wanted to keep keep uh, the the same system we have currently for SCADA. So that became a separate contract, so we could guarantee that. But uh, as you can see, there's a lot of a lot of things uh, happening here with this, and a lot of uh, testing and integration um, as we get up and running. And so this contract is just underway. A lot of submittals, nothing really uh, out there in the field being built at this juncture. But as we get uh, later in this year uh, and in the next year, certainly the systems work will start happening out in the field. So any questions on that piece? Otherwise, I'll invite Tracy and uh, John up to talk about DBE. Okay. Good afternoon, um, Chair, Council Members. I'm Tracy Jackson. I'm the Senior Manager of the Office of Equal Opportunity, and we're here today. Um, John Bangkow and I will be here to present on DBE and the workforce <coughs> update. So getting started here, bef um, before I get into the update, I always like to talk first about the differences between the DBE program and workforce, because there sometimes can be some confusion that uh, DBE is a Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Program. And so the DBE program is the small businesses and the way we, um, we have the participation as measured is by the dollars that are paid to them. And so for an example, as we're focused on the civil contract today, we have a 16% DBE goal. And then workforce, that is the skilled workers and the way we count the participation for that is uh, measured by the hours worked. So you've got your small business and you have your skilled workers. So together, the DBE and workforce support the council's equity commitments to the region. The next three slides, um, I'm gonna um, go through these with you. Um, they're the active Southwest contracts. And I'm just gonna highlight a few of these. So just to give you an example, um, this first slide is for the contracts for professional services. So for our consultants for the design. Um, so you'll see where AECOM has a 19% DBE goal. They're the large advanced design contract and their um, billings to date, you'll see that. And then at the end of that column, they are achieving 19.48%. And then just going through the rest of them, you can read those, but looking at most of the contracts then are meeting or exceeding their DBE goal. Um, the second one there, HNTB, there is a shortfall there um, as we actively found out from the project office as we partner with them that there was a scope change, um, we immediately then take action to work with that consultant to discuss um, what their DBE plan will be and what good faith efforts they will take. So they are a little bit short, but we're working with them and their efforts are go going well, but the project is 95% complete there. So then at the bottom, you'll see that the totals um, are 
as an average of all professional services is 18.38, and the um, PBE to date then is 1906. So going to the next one, this is our construction where we have the large contracts with a, our civil contract on top with a 16% goal. Um, well, they're currently achieving 14.3%. We're moving into heavy construction for the 2020-21 seasons. Um, we also, and then the, just to note here on the last one, the, the systems contract that Jim just discussed that um, we're just getting starting and started. There's zero dollars there and zero percent to date, but those will be coming as the project participation will follow <laughs> later this year. And then the, um, here's the combination of all of the slides. So the professional services, the construction, and then the very last final one, you'll see the DBE totals, which is an average of all the contracts. And so that average is 15.66 and the achievement is 16.89. So we really have some good achievement for DBE. The next slide shows a trend of the payments that are made to DBEs that are on the project for civil. So they're trending towards the 16% uh, goal. <coughs> Next, we want to um, talk a little bit of showing the chart of how we work with our DBE businesses and we're breaking apart um, the ethnicities. So this graph represents 55 businesses that the joint venture has committed to for this project. So by doing that, um, just looking at the chart, we do um, show that the commitments represents all ethnicity groups. We also did a breakdown of the DB 55 DBEs into the gender. So it's close to a 50-50 on that. We have a quick question. Uh, sure. Member Alex. Thank you, something? Chair. Um, I just want to make sure that on the slide before I'm taking a look at it, kind of looking with the lens of our population. Do you know, um, it looks like um, state-wise, there might be some over-representation, but probably not metro area population being represented here. Do you know how these numbers reflect to the population um, potential for employment? Um, in each of those demographic groups. Chair, Council Member Atlas Ingram, thank you for that question. Um, I can't really speak to the, you know, the availability and how when the contractor commits to the DBEs, they're looking at the scopes of work and the, you know, the women and minority businesses that can do that work. Um, this is just the breakdown of that, but to answer, you know, I'm not gonna be able to directly answer that question onto the availability of what is in the region here. Thank you, Chair. I think this is one place where I'm 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 curious about: are, is there overrepresentation and underrepresentation? So, um, just knowing what I know about basic population of our metro region, African American population being the largest um, um, single group, um, and they're fairly poorly represented in this number. So that would be a helpful thing, just because also the employable population within is a different number than general population. So that would be a helpful note for us tracking, are we successful with our DBE efforts? Um, it would be more realistic of a, a metric to be able to, to measure against that. That would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we can do a follow-up with that, thank you. Okay, so I will, we've touched on the gender, ethnicity. Um, here's another chart where we wanna um, break it down by the state. So. Um, it shows that over 85% of the DBE businesses are from our Minnesota home-based. And then we have a small percent of 4% from other states. So they're certified in their home state as well as Minnesota. So but those are where the dollars are going to the small business. And now I will turn it over to, oh, I have one more slide. So um, the activities from the joint venture. So we want to talk a little bit about how they're engaging the DBEs on the project. Um, they had a meeting, if you look at the photo there, that was their meeting in December where they asked and invited all their DBEs to come to meet with them. And so they had different topics like let's talk about invoicing, um, how are things going, um, pay cycles, change orders, schedule. So and in this meeting, they um, 
identify two lead employees from LMJV to be mentors to each DBE. So each DBE were able to find out who was their mentor. So if they had any questions, concerns, they can go directly to that mentor. So that was a very positive thing. Um, they also, in change orders, so when LMJV is having a change order, they will look for opportunities to either increase a DBE that's already working on the contract or maybe another opportunity to bring in a new DBE at that time. So that's positive. And they also, on a case-by-case -case basis, they'll look at cash flow assistance for DBEs if needed. Any questions on DBE before I um, pass it over to Dr. Uh, Member Sterner? Did you yes, sorry, thank you, uh, Chair. I just had a, if you could refresh my memory, what, what is the definition of a DBE exactly, you know, size and that type of thing? For the size? Okay, so to become a DBE small business, you have to apply. It's a certification program here. Um, it's a national certification through, US, and through USDOT, and they have to qualify socially and economically. So for socially, they have to be one of the pres a woman or one of the presumptive groups and ethnicities. And then for economically, they have to meet the, whatever their business is, their NAIC size, the small business sta standards size as well as a personal net worth um, under 1.32 million. 1.3, okay, um, just one more. Uh, sure. So the size, what, exactly the size, is it just by the 1.3 is makes of the size or by number of employees or, well, as well? Or? So 1.3, uh, Chair, Council Member, thank you for the question. So to clarify that, so there's two ways for economically um, certificate, you know, they have to qualify for requirements. So personal net worth, is all their assets minus their liabilities. They have to be with under 1.32 million. The size standard, they go by the Small Business uh, Administration size standards per their NAICS code of what type of uh, work that they do. And so um, each one of those is different. And then some of them are by employee, but most of them are by a certain threshold dollar amount. Okay. This is a federal uh, uh, regulatory uh, guidelines. Mm -hmm. And since we expect federal funds, that's important for this case. Okay, that's very good. All right, thank you. Member Lillikan? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I just have a quick question about, I, th I think you called it the cash flow assistance program or something about that. And what's the <coughs> level of utilization of that program? Okay, that's, yeah. And so this is through the joint venture. Okay. Not through our Office of Equal okay. Opportunity, but it's through the joint venture. And I can't really speak to the specifics okay. on that, but it's on a case-by-case -case basis. So right. if there's a DBE who's um, completed some work or they're looking for some payment, then they'll work with that DBE to assist them. Yeah. Thank you. And I know that's quite a barrier sometimes to uh, minority-owned businesses and DBE. Working capital. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you. Uh, my name is John Bang Tao, and uh, I will be uh, talking about workforce goals today. So for workforce, we partner pretty closely with the Minnesota Department of Human Rights. Uh, they set the goals for uh, construction contracts within the region that have a contract value over 100000 So for the uh, counties of Ramsey County and uh, Hennepin County, they uh, set the goals for 32% for people of color and then 20% uh, for women. They are also uh, responsible for uh, monitoring those contracts for compliance to these uh, goals and uh, the you know, regulations that guide it. So uh, what does this look like? Uh, what they do is they review the uh, pre-construction packets that are submitted by the contractors. And uh, they look at the projected hours on the contract. And the contractors uh, plan that they uh, you know, want to implement towards meeting those goals. And then they also uh, need to submit monthly uh, reports covering their activities that they've taken to meet those goals or work towards those goals and their actual participation from those uh, activities and uh, on the construction site. In addition to that, they also conduct on-site visits, uh, you know, going out to the site, actually talking to people, counting heads, and, uh, you know, uh, having actual conversations with the uh, construction workers out there in the field. So uh, what I have here is uh, some charts 
as uh, to the workforce participation that has been achieved to date since the construction season started in uh, April. Uh, I want to keep in mind that uh, the current project uh, right now is currently only 15% uh, progress in completion. So there's still a lot more construction that's uh, to be uh, done. And uh, in 2019, there was, as you've seen in the earlier pictures, a lot of pile driving and heavy machine operators doing a lot of work out there. So not necessarily uh, the labor force and uh, the really uh, you know, uh, boots on the ground that you normally see on a construction site. Um, and then, uh, you know, for the women, the goal was 20%. And uh, as of right now, for October, uh, the Department of Human Rights shared that they've uh, counted about 8.68% 8 8 of that for women achievement. And this is a cumulative, cumulative total that has been, uh, you know, collected and reported on and confirmed throughout uh, from the start of the project to October. So uh, as we continue on, we uh, expect this number to go up. And uh, I also want to acknowledge that although these numbers are not yet meeting the goals, this is an opportunity for uh, us to you know, look at different uh, methods and different strategies about how we can work with a prime contractor and our stakeholders in the community towards uh, meeting the goal. And uh, I think a little bit later, we will talk about the DBE and Workforce Advisory Committee, where we have uh, experts that will uh, work with us and provide input uh, on different ways we can uh, work towards these uh, goals. So uh, next up is the uh, people of color uh, chart, which you know, we are uh, trending at 17.23, uh, and it's still short of the goal. But uh, as I said before, you know, we're only about 15% into the completion of the whole project for this contract. So uh, we do want to be proactive and work with the prime contractor and uh, work very closely with Minnesota Department of Human Rights to uh, see what we can do to uh, uh, meet these goals. So when you look at the cumulative hours, uh, this pie chart kind of shows you uh, where we are at and where the breakdown of the hours of, uh, that's been worked and the uh, populations that have uh, categories that have uh, received those hours. And uh, these categories are, uh, comes from a report that the Minnesota Department of Human Rights provides us. And uh, it's from certified payrolls that's been reported by the contractors on the project. So, and uh, working with the prime contractor, London McCross and Joint Venture, uh, they've shared with us their uh, plan to meet this goals. And uh, their plan is to work with the unions, uh, community-based organizations and government agencies. And what does that look like? Well, it is going to career fairs, having mock interviews with these training programs, uh, being guest speakers at graduations, and conducting project, uh, construction project site tours, and uh, letting students come onto the site and seeing, like, this is the work environment you're going to be in, uh, you're going to get dirty, those type of things. And then also uh, proactively uh, creating a welcoming culture for women and people of color on the work site. And when they do that, you know, what they're doing is, uh, you know, trying to make people feel welcome. In addition to that, uh, something that they've shared that they're uh, trying to do is not just going towards the construction workforce, but in their own organization, hiring key personnel, uh, you know, uh, women of color into those positions and retaining them. Uh, and then uh, doing an annual on-site training and I think uh, they also do uh, on-site visits to these construction sites uh, randomly and have uh, actual conversations with the construction workers, not just the women and people of color. Uh, and they've shared that, you know, some of these conversations have led them to uh, find out about uh, different issues that sometimes women and people of color don't feel comfortable about bringing it up. So it's been proactive and it's been helpful for them to identify issues before it becomes larger issues. And then uh, as for our activities and the Southwest uh, Light Rail Project Office, uh, we've been working with the workforce development team to uh, put together a construction training fair for January 22nd at the Minneapolis Urban League. And uh, I have some flyers here for this event. Um, 
that I can share out and uh, we welcome you to share this with your networks. Um, you know, we want to find as many people that want to be a part of this project for them to come and, uh, you know, be a part of this construction training fair. And this is not just uh, bringing out uh, just for this uh, training program, but uh, we're bringing out Summit Academy, uh, American Indian OIC, North Hennepin Community College, and Goodwill Easter Seals. They have some of those construction training programs. And then our workforce development team has been working on uh, our own internal Met Council initiative called uh, Building Stronger, I mean, Building Strong Communities. And that's a construction apprenticeship preparation program that is in partnership with the unions and uh, higher education to uh, roll out some kind of a program that is uh, bringing everybody else to the table so that uh, we can uh, start moving the needle in the positive direction. So uh, next we have here is a, uh, a great visual, I mean, a great visual showing the uh, uh, where the populations who make up the women and people of color, where are they coming from? Mm. And it shows that, you know, where are these paycheck dollars for this construction project? Where are they going back to? What communities are they going back to? And it's, you know, spread across our region, uh, which is a great sign. Uh, when you look at the metro area, you know, it's, it's pretty dispersed, uh, pretty wide there too. And uh, as I said before, you know, we've confirmed <coughs> or MDHR has confirmed these uh, numbers. Uh, through certified payroll. Uh, with that, I'm going to pass it back to Tracy Jackson to uh, share a little bit more about the advisory committee. Okay, thank you, John. Um, our last slide here on DBE and workforce. So another way that we engage with our contractors and DBEs, we have established this committee. Um, it's advisory, so it's a collaborative of partners. Um, that we've held in uh, 2019. We held five meetings with these topics that we've already discussed. We have many more um, challenges and opportunities that we're gonna continue. Um, this committee is made up of community-based organizations. We have union representation, uh, the minority and women contractors associations, as well as other government agencies, Hennepin County, Mendot, and Hennepin County. So um, we look forward, this also provides transparency and accountability to those contractors who are um, needing to meet those goals. So thank you for your time. We'll pause here for questions. Uh, Member Chambliss. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'm curious to know how, do you know how many apprenticeships are offered for that construction training? Um, so what they're doing, uh, I would say Aaron Kosky from our uh, workforce development team, he can better uh, answer that question. But what they've shared with us is that uh, they're looking at the construction schedule and then the uh, scopes of work that, you know, are scheduled to be out there to help uh, pinpoint which uh, trades to uh, you know look for people to work with and then they are also working with the unions to talk about their training programs what time when do they uh, hire and then how long does it take to complete the trainings so that they can line up with the construction schedule and the construction season thank you let's see oh member atlas ingerbitson thank you chair um first i want to thank and i don't have everybody's name because it's not on the it's not on the presentation but i want to thank all of you here. Um, I want to thank Sai because I've been I've had many conversations about the type of data and the way it's presented so that we can make informed decisions. And this is a really good example for doing that. And I feel heard. So I want to say thank you to all of you um, for providing the information in a way that allows us to make thoughtful um, decisions from a place of strength. Um, so I deeply want to just appreciate that I um, and, and recognize that effort and, and work. Um, there's two things that I, I hope for, um, and a lot of the questions I was developing, you guys were answering, all, answering along the way, so just really thorough. One, um, I want to um, say what I hope for is as we see vendors who are successful with their workforce and DBE goals, if there's an opportunity um, as we go to hear what are some of the tactics um, and best practices they're using, if we can learn some of those things so that um, when others are struggling, we know to say, hey, here's a great 
um, tactic you can use. From my time at um, the city of Minneapolis, hearing you know what were good things and and meeting these goals and working for some departments and real and 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 when others were struggling was really helpful. Um, to accelerate um, work around that, I'm I'm hopeful and want to want to continue um, to see us reach reach these goals. That, that's I know um, really important for us. I also want to really um, acknowledge the value of the geography and and seeing that to be able to tell the story of the value of these projects, clearly not just to our region <laughs> but also to Wisconsin. They owe us um, <laughs> a little bit. So I, I wanted to just share that affirmation and appreciation. And now I feel a lot better able to answer questions um, that come up a lot um, as it relates to the investments we make around equity. And also to acknowledge that this is a great way that we do address the disparities in our region and can prevent homelessness. Um, many people are one paycheck away from being in that situation. So these meeting these DBE goals, meeting these workplace goals are ways that we can keep people out of a homeless situation. Or, you know, maybe that's the next step. <laughs> How do we get those people that we've gotten into housing into one of these jobs? Um, I'm a dreamer, forgive me. But I just wanted to share that appreciation and thank you, thank you, thank you, and thank you, thank you. Thank you. Any other question for the, oh, uh, Council Member Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. I have a First of all, I want to appreciate you you're having these town hall type meetings where you bring in folks to ask questions. And I have a question about financial equity. If one of these small businesses, um, if, if we require them of them of certain kind of insurance coverage for this job, and they've never done that before, they don't have that kind of insurance coverage, or, or there's a fee for that, can we waive that fee or eat that fee, or do we not do that because it will expose us? Chair, council member, thank you for that question. Um, there are some assistance programs. Uh, a lot of, um, we have some mentor protege uh, programs as well, where we are um, looking to the prime to help assist in some of those um, for insurance and bonding, because that is absolutely a barrier. Um, and so we are working with those primes to help assist. There are other organizations that will also assist, um, whether, um, the project office has partnered, I'm going to look to Jim real quick, I don't know if we've been um, waiving any of those requirements, if, if you can speak oh, to that. Oh yeah, Mr. Chair, Council Member, well, we don't necessarily waive that, I think well, Phil Wall Jasper might uh, kind of slap my hand for doing something like that, but uh, we're, our, our relationship is really with LMJV in this case for the civil, because that's our contractual relationship, and we require them to, to, to have certain bonds, certain insurance, and they, in, in course, have their relationships contractually with their subs. And so it's really LMJB working with their subs to, uh, to make sure that they have the proper insurance. But we really look, since our contractual relationship is with LMJB, we look to them to have that. So that, that typically is, is something that uh, has go through the procurement. That's what we stick with. Thank you. Questions? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Mr. Chair. Uh, Thank you for this great presentation. Uh, I would like to know what kind of outreach are we doing to reach out to communities who speak English as a second language? And also, can you send us, um, at least send me the list of uh, community-based organizations that we're working with and the list of the unions that we're partnering with to see if there's any you know, uh, value we can add? So in regards to small business and workforce, I think, I don't know if you're referring for the workforce. Your, okay. So chair, council member, um, John, do you want to speak to that? <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, the workforce uh, development team, they have this uh, new program that they're rolling out called Building Strong Communities. And uh, what they've shared is they work with uh, community-based organizations such as CLUES, uh, Asian Media Access, uh, Emerge, you know, uh, Cedar Riverside, and uh, you know some of those community-based organizations that have these uh, uh, better inroads and relationships with the community uh, that communities that you know uh, have English as a second language, and they're uh, working with them in partnership to help recruit for this program. Uh, I, I believe that they have a website uh, that. Uh, can share more about those partnerships and which uh, organizations specifically. And then uh, I think something that they wanted to do was also to, if there are any other organizations or training institutions that would like to be a part of this training fair, that you know they can 
always uh, look to bring more people to the table and uh, create more opportunities for people in the community. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Oh, we have one more segment to cover. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Chair, Councils, and Council Members. I'm Sam O'Connell, and I'll talk about communications and outreach. Um, 2019 was a very exciting year for us. So it's basically all of those years that we talked about design and engineering came to life in the communities. So it became very, very real, as you can imagine, um, for all of our, our neighborhoods, for our businesses along the corridor. What I'm going to share with you today is talk a little bit about what we did in terms of outreach and communications and some of our metrics that we are using to measure how good we're doing. Um, I would be remiss if I do not thank our city and our county partners and our state agencies and our watershed districts and our park boards in helping us communicate um, progress on this project and where to get that information. So they've been a wonderful support and everybody around um, the table here too as well. So thank you for supporting our communications on this. So how do we communicate? So we have asked folks to make sure they sign up for our weekly uh, project update that comes out every Friday. And um, it's, a, it's a tool that we've been using since April, so really kind of when we started construction. Um, we've also asked folks to kind of just sort of opt into, our, into the, the program so they can follow us on Twitter. The council has also highlighted a lot of our progress as well in Instagram. And we also have a Flickr account to really kind of show um, some of the progress in, in, in that Jim has shared in those pictures and really tell our story. Um, there's also really good information, again, that we try and let the communities know about what to, what to expect with this project. And we have videos that talk about this project, um, specifically a really interesting video of how we are doing preservation in the corridor, um, particularly around our WPA wall that's at the channel. And it's a, it's, it's a really exciting piece to know. Not only are we building this wonderful transportation investment, but we're also doing other things in terms of the corridor. Um, and of course, all of our committee information. So as Tracy talked about our DBE and Workforce Advisory Committee, we also have additional committees that support the work that we do and we do that in partnership and a lot of that information is there. The, the pictures that I really kind of pulled out and just want to highlight for you as well that are on the slide is really that personal touch. It is really that outreach team that is out in the community. We go where the folks are. And in, exist, in this example, we have a pop-up event along the trails to talk about our project. Um, that is where we see our most success. Although we talk about the work that we do through communications and outreach, it really is about relationships. And that's when we had some of those tough dis uh, discussions about design and engineering, it really did sort of propel us to get us to where we are today with construction. The other uh, picture on there is also our outreach vehicle. So um, when you work for a transit agency, you get a retired vehicle every now and then. And so what we've done, if uh, folks have not seen this vehicle, it's actually been um, gutted out on the inside. So there are no seats. And what it is is basically a lot of displays that talk about the project. The reason why this um, bus is so special for us, it allows us to get into neighborhoods. It allows us to get in front of um, businesses, um, employment centers and really invite the public in and it's staffed with our outreach coordinators and really talk about the project. So think of like a storefront that we can move along the corridor and it's a great tool. And again, just wanted to um, make you aware of that tool and we hope to use it more and more. Um, so one of the uh, pieces that, that we have here is Gov Delivery. So this is how our um, weekly update it is uh, uh, transmitted to, uh, to the public. And you can see our first Gov Delivery um, sort of project update went out in April, April 26, and we had about 8,200 folks. And I'm happy to say by December, we're basically doubling that. So that means about 16,000 uh, emails, you know, folks are either opening that up or looking at their phone and getting the text to say, hey, this is what's happening on Southwest LRT in terms of construction and what to expect. We have about a 48% open rate, which is phenomenal. So um, we're hoping that that's a good indication that we are providing the information folks are looking for as we talk about construction. Um, our website also is, um, you can kind of see the bell curve in the numbers there when we start really hitting that construction in May, folks really wanted to know 
what was going on. So we were happy to see that 60,000 number. Um, as folks become more comfortable and learn the tools to receive the information, either through gov delivery or talking to our staff, you kind of see that number going down as well. Um, as we get back into the warmer season, we hope to see those hits increasing on the website. Uh, Twitter metrics, a little bit new for us in terms of using uh, Twitter. So we're still kind of learning. And thank you for all the retweets. I do appreciate that. Um, we started out with about uh, 842 followers back in January, and we're up to about 1,400 followers. So if please follow us, it's a great way to share the information that we're doing. We like to highlight some of the things that we find in the corridor, some of the pictures that um, highlight the construction. So it's a great way to actually see what's going on because sometimes it's really hard to actually see that and get really intimate with our construction activities. Um, our Flickr account, as I mentioned, um, it's a great way to see what is going on by community, and it's a great way to see how the corridor is changing over time. So if you're interested in, for example, Louisiana Station, you kind of understood what that looked like before we actually came in and started with construction activities. And these pictures are updated on a pretty periodic basis, so you can see over time what that area is going to look like. So this begins to tell our story, share our story with our communities, with our city and county partners in particular, um, so folks can see what we're doing. Um, one of the tools that we use that has been very successful for us is our 24-hour hotline. We have about 110 signs along the corridor that look like that blue sign on there that has that 612-373-3933 phone number, and really it is, it's answered 24 hours a day, and there's sort of two ways that we triage the phone calls. Um, we do get a lot of phone calls where people are just looking for just basic information. Um, when is the line opening? Uh, what station might be near me? And that's really, that comes back to our outreach team, and we usually answer those calls within 24 hours. Um, and that really is kind of the bulk of the, the conversations that we do have. But for those issues where there is a construction truck blocking my access right now, that goes into our kind of urgent um, a section, and that actually activates a call tree with our staff and our construction staff so we can immediately get to that issue right away and resolve that issue. So we've re had about close to 500 calls right now um, as we look at the end of December. Um, we anticipate with construction activities being more robust and intense this year, that, that number will probably increase. I also want to mention that this is one way that we are able to interact with our public. We also receive a lot of emails directly to our staff, and I think some of you are CC'd on them as well, as well as just folks who have been so comfortable with our outreach coordinators, they just call them up to just talk to them and talk to the issues. So this is just one of those tools. Business outreach as well. Um, this is a, um, a really strong emphasis, emphasis for us. We want to make sure that we're doing no harm to any of our business um, members while we're out there. So we really make an effort to ensure that we're meeting with them, they're aware of what we're doing. As we get into construction closer to their area, that we're sitting down and we're talking about when do you have your deliveries? When do your employees get it? How, did, how do your customers actually receive that information? So we can make those plans and put that into consideration as we do construction. And so part of the, what we can do is develop some of that content um, about construction that our businesses can share with their customers and their employees, and also um, work on some special signage if needed. Outreach activities, just the pictures here to kind of show what our team does. I love when I come into the office and I can't find my outreach team. And the reason why is because I know what they're doing. They're out in the community. They're completely empowered to do that, and we're very excited when they are. Um, so we've done uh, this particular year in 2019, we did a round of open houses, kind of like first year of construction, what do you need to know, and really kind of go out to each of the communities to talk about that. Um, trail pop-ups was also a big thing, as we all know that the folks are very concerned about connectivities with regional trails um, as part of our project. Um, walking tours, just uh, working with the neighborhood uh, community group and saying, you know, uh, if you have a monthly meeting, we can have an outreach coordinator come out and walk with you a little bit and talk about some of the construction and just our regular neighborhood meetings as well. We will continue. 
So as we look forward for 2020 here, and here we are, um, we also have some new things coming up. And one is the um, implementation of our construction information work groups. I know that's a lot, so we just call them CIWs. And each of our five communities along the corridor will have a CIW. And it's really um, made up of members of the public and business community that want a little bit more information provides them an opportunity to provide immediate and relevant feedback to us and how we're doing with uh, construction communications and outreach. And really, they will determine how often they meet and kind of the issues that they cover. So it's sort of a self-directed group, but really with the intent of we're partnering with our stakeholders and our communities and making sure we're adjusting our communication and outreach efforts as needed. We'll continue out with the pop-ups. As Jim talked about the tours, I think that's the most exciting piece that, and some of you have been out there and you can see some of the equipment that we're using. You can see some of the stations that will be popping out of the ground. So we're looking forward to doing that. Um, we'll continue with our annual events. You know, Raspberry Days is a great day for us to be out there and talking about not only the project, but you know, how you can also get more involved, whether it's through hiring and working on the project. And we'll continue some exciting pieces with our project videos. So I'm happy to stand with any questions, but I'll just turn this over to Jim too, as I know we're getting close to time. All right, well, thanks, Sam. Well, just to conclude, uh, this is our presentation for tonight. And uh, again, we'll be back uh, uh, in about three or four months to give you another update. And uh, we're always, uh, we always have our phone available if you wanna call and find out what's going on. We'll, we'll retrieve those anytime. Um, did wanna mention that uh, we have a couple of uh, items uh, going to be in front of St. Louis Park uh, uh, the City Council on the 3rd of February and uh, <coughs> Hopkins uh, City Council on the 4th of February. So those are, I think those are in the agenda for now and uh, we'll be presenting, giving them updates. And we, we essentially invite uh, to do updates to any of the cities that want to uh, get an update on what's going on. Thank you. Uh, Member Alex Engerpitzen, did you have? <laughs> You're getting a lot of practice. <laughs> I'm, get, I'm getting it. That, that's my goal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, I want to just say a thank you um, to the team. Starting at the council, this was, I had emails. I had, before getting a sworn in, had <laughs> communications about this project. Um, and, and it's a project that is changing the landscape that um, has impacted people and, and certainly um, a morning um, stage is, is a part of that project. It's been challenging and you've been at it a lot longer than, than I have. And I wanna say that um, Jim specifically um, at a shared joint public safety meeting did just a phenomenal job um, in representing our work with integrity and honesty. And sometimes that's really hard when it's not always perfect. Um, but um, after that meeting um, along the Kenilworth Corridor, hearing from residents um, trust um, and an appreciation for the honesty. Um, so I just wanna say thank you because it makes this work really doable to have that kind of support and excellent work from staff and Sam's um, weekly calls um, to provide whatever information and to really truly listen and be open to all of the things that the, the community needs and, and her team, David um, Davies as well. Um, it could be eight o'clock at night and something comes up and often, and I scold him about this, often he's responding, you know, um, and Sam is as well and I'm sure Jim is, is also. So I just really wanna acknowledge um, the challenging nature of these kinds of projects, this one in particular, and um, appreciate your work and your support of, of myself and all of the community members, and just wanna continue with words of appreciation and, and, and encouragement to continue that empathetic, supportive, um, truthful, and just class act um, way of doing the work. It's not always gonna be perfect. The things I hope for for the future of this is um, continue to think about bike pet safety things coming up um, around that and in partnership with Hennepin County and, and the city of Minneapolis in particular, um, um, as those are those are really impacted. Um, big concerns for the community around conservation and starting to think proactively about how we re what's and what comes after this project. Um, and I think we have an opportunity to really um, build trust in a long, 
long way if we can really rebuild um, the Kenilworth corridor, but the entire space to be something that's naturally even healthier than what was there before. And I think that's truly possible and could be not just something that's a beacon for those communities, Hopkins, St. Louis Park, Eden Prairie, Minneapolis, but could be an example that leads the world in how we can possibly do more conservation and development at the same time. And I think with climate change, that's just so important. So I just wanted to give those words of appreciation and, and aspirations for the future. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm really cognizant of the time. So I, I know that uh, you've been living with this project. I will just say I've lived with this project as a partner uh, with this team uh, from MnDOT and then as a impacted resident of the Kenilworth Corridor. Uh, I am a subscriber, and I've actually made one of those phone calls. So I tell you, your professionalism <laughs> of your group is really remarkable, and I think you're we really unfortunate. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry, I just have one one quick comment. Um, for six years, uh, I was constituent director for Mayor Chris Coleman, and I really appreciate the the outreach and communication you do. Uh, you, you are the frontline staff that has the public facing jobs. Um, for us out in the community, and at the end of the day, for us as government, that's where the rubber hits the road. And we can never pay you enough, so thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. We will see you again. <laughs> uh, we, uh, and I am aware of the time, we're, uh, not that there's a deadline, but uh, maybe there is. Uh, but I, uh, I will be brief. Thank you so much for all you do. We are, as I am learning, um, not just stewards, but ambassadors for all that that council does. So when we think about how we go out into our own neighborhoods and districts, um, we are an opportunity to help that connection. I love this philosophy that um, engagement starts by going to where people are instead of having them find us. And mm -hmm. That's uh, nice for when you think about our roles as council members. Uh, we have an opportunity for uh, individual reports. I'm going to like, uh, if it's less than three minutes, I'm going to shoot you. No, I'm not going to shoot you. Excuse me. <laughs> I'm going to like, point out that we're late, but it's late. <laughs> Having said that, does anybody have anything to say? Uh, does the regional administrator have anything to report? Uh, we may cancel the committee the whole next week. Stay tuned. <laughs> All right. Uh, Chief General Counsel. Welcome to the council. Oh, it's already up, my dear. Any other comments or thoughts? Thank you very much. This is, these were great reports, and I thank you all. I will welcome. speak. Welcome. Learn something, and uh, thank you. I feel very welcome. This meeting is adjourned.